Good afternoon. My name is Sophia Chan Combrink, and I'm the executor of executive director of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce here in Hong Kong. Welcome to our webinar today, Hong Kong Real Estate: Time for Tokenization. Um, so, a little bit about the chamber. We're a nonprofit, non-governmental organization created in 1977. We have over 1,200 members representing nearly 300 companies, uh, making us one of the largest uh, Canadian business organizations outside Canada and one of the most active international chambers in Hong Kong. Uh, for non-Canadians listening in, uh, it is important for you to know that we are an inclusive and diverse community. In fact, about 40% of our membership are non-Canadian, so everyone's welcome. Please consider joining. So what do we do exactly? We deliver four services to our members. Uh, that is one, representation and advocacy engagement. Of course, business promotion, networking and brand exposure, uh, learning and training, which is what we're gonna be doing some of that today, and information and insight. Uh, today, we're bringing you a conversation about uh, real estate and tokenization. During the session, if you'd like to submit questions or comments via the chat box, please do so. I think we're all familiar with how to do that, so thank you. I'd like to pause and acknowledge some key members of our community who are participating in this morning's event. Um, Max Berger, a uh, longtime member of the chamber and uh, chair, the chairman of Golian Limited, an investment management company providing equity and debt to enterprises in the uh, F and CG fast moving consumer goods space. Uh, a few more. Olivia Dong. Olivia is a partner with Weir and Associates, and she's been a speaker at the chamber uh, about immigration issues and taxation issues. Andrew Work, a well-known Canadian in our community, not only because he was in my role for several years, but he regularly hosted our uh, annual ball. He's editor-in-chief with Harbor Times and also the exec director with Self Storage a Association Asia. Uh, Yong Ki Hong is partner with Dwyer Lynch and Company, and they are chartered valuation surveyors and agents specializing in the Hong Kong commercial property rental market. So if you're new to CanCham Hong Kong, you would like to subscribe or even join as a member, feel free to contact us on our website, cancham.org. We have a number of other events coming up and we'd like to welcome you to those, so please stay tuned. Uh, may I please hand it over to now Janice Yao, partner at Stevenson Harwood, who is your moderator for today. And uh, I look forward to uh, joining this webinar and learning more about tokenization and real estate. Thank you to all of our speakers as well. Janice? Thank you, Sophia. A uh, big welcome to our audience and of course, all of our esteemed speakers who will be discussing whether or not it actually is time for real estate tokenization in Hong Kong. My name is Janice Yao Garten. I'm a real estate partner at Stevenson Harwood, keen to help bring technological advances to an age old asset class. On our panel today, we have Scott Teal of DLA Piper, the lead partner for TOCO, a platform that delivers token offerings at scale. Scott, please tell us a bit about you and your experience with uh, real estate tokenization. Thanks, uh, thanks, Janice. Uh, great to be here and, and hi, everyone. So um, as Janice said, I'm a partner at DLA. Um, I'm actually a technology lawyer. I'm not a real estate lawyer, so I'm the, um, I'm the odd one out on the panel. Um, my, my background is very much in uh, computer science and technology related legal issues. Um, I've been uh, sort of leading the firm's development of uh, the TOCO platform, which is a tokenization uh, engine and digital asset management solution that we've been building over the last couple of years and have recently launched. So it's been great working with um, colleagues in you know, not only the corporate finance, but also the real estate space to start to bring uh, the reality of a digital capital market um, to, to Hong Kong and indeed other markets around the world. So uh, pleased to be here. Thank you, Scott. Um, we also have Shashila Rivers from DLA Piper, who is the co-chair of the global real estate sector, head of the real estate group and the hospitality and leisure group for Asia Pacific. Shashila, please kindly tell us about yourself and how tokenization can help economic recovery from the current COVID downturn. Thank you, Janice. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Canadian Chamber. Um, you are quite right. Tokenization is a buzzword. People talk about it. People don't fully understand it. And I think what, what you say, Janice, with, with tokenization, um, the big part of it is technology. So technology brings an, an aspect to owning uh, real estate um, in, in the new way. So I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the, the Q&A or the panel discussion that we have. Um, but hopefully tokenization will be a little bit more familiar at the end of today's session. 
Thanks, Sheila. And last but not least, we have King Lun, Head of FinTech at Invest Hong Kong. King, please share with us what Head of FinTech means and the role of Invest Hong Kong uh, plays in attracting foreign direct investment. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to meet uh, all of you online. So basically, Invest Hong Kong has been around for over 20 years in helping the overseas companies to get to know more about the Hong Kong economy. In particular, for the fintech space, uh, our team was established back in 2016. So the role is really to help international folks to understand how to uh, basically leverage on the environment we have in Hong Kong and do business. Now, and there's another hat that our uh, team wears, and that is to foster the developments of fintech uh, in Hong Kong. So that basically encompasses everything from uh, working more closely with corporates, with the investors, with the regulators, you know, uh, other parts of partners like Sapa Port, Science Park, to basically help the community understand better about where the resources lie. It can be investment, it can be how to get connection with the right clients, uh, it can be to access the various government uh, subsidy schemes. So uh, in a nutshell, the, what our team at Invest Hong Kong do as a government uh, department of uh, the Hong Kong SAR government is to be the sort of single point of contact as a conduit to connect uh, FinTech the players to the right resources. So that's, okay. that's what we do. Thank you, King. That sounds like a very important role that you play for Hong Kong there. Uh, we are moving to a digital economy where financial and physical assets will increasingly have digital representations of their value. So before our panel discussion, we will have Scott first teach us a bit about what tokenization actually is and how it is relevant to real estate. Please take it away, Scott. Okay, thanks, Janice. I'm just getting the uh, presentation up. And okay, um, so thanks everyone. So we'll just do a quick overview um, for around about 10 minutes of what real estate tokenization is and perhaps more importantly, why it's going to bring some advantages to um, both investor and also the asset owner um, in terms of creating new marketplaces and new opportunities. And I think it's particularly relevant at a time in Hong Kong where real estate's obviously a, a, you know, a huge Huge asset class. It's a very expensive asset. Uh, it's something that many people aspire to participate in, uh, and obviously, it's been a relatively challenging time of late as well. So, what is tokenization? Um, there is there's a whole presentation that could be given on this, and there are different many different ways of looking at it. But, but essentially, it's a way of fractionalizing an interest, taking an asset or indeed a, a number of assets, and then breaking it into pieces, and then having those individual elements of the asset being represented in a, in a digital form. And more importantly, and this is where blockchain technology kicks in, recording that interest on a blockchain or a decentralized ledger. Uh, a decentralized ledger doesn't require central trusted authorities, um, things like land registries, to, to use an obvious example of a, uh, a differing you know, central registry system. Uh, decentralized systems have the ability to keep an accurate and consistent record of things like who owns what, uh, but in multiple copies across the uh, across multiple machines and computers and countries in a way that doesn't require that central authority. So we do already have some examples of fractional interests in, in real estate. So REITs, um, ETFs, mutual funds. There are there are obviously examples of all of these you know, that, that, that in one way or another provide people with access to fractions of uh, individual assets. However, the ability to now use blockchain technology and tokenization technology, we believe, and I think um, we will certainly see, is going to create a lot more uh, flexibility, uh, security and transparency, and indeed more creative products. So the advantages then of tokenization, from the perspective of an asset owner, uh, there is the potential for increased liquidity and spreading of risk. So taking your asset, attracting uh, new investors to it, and providing them with the ability to buy and sell those interests in a way that perhaps those other structures such as REITs and ETFs don't really require, uh, don't really provide the level of um, liquidity that we, we, we would aspire to. Uniquely structured offerings is one that I'm particularly interested in. So again, if you look at a lot of you know, REITs and, and funds and ETFs, they're, they're essentially bundles of real estate assets and people can, can buy a unit in or a share in and participate. The, the, there are options with uh, security tokens to create much more 
specific assets that are highly relevant to either a particular property or even a, a, an individual unit within a particular piece of property. So it's kind of like unpicking. I think a lot of the traditional investing is done in funds or collection of properties. Actually, the security token will allow us to actually take a, a very small uh, and specific piece of, a, of an asset or indeed a, a part of an asset. And that will allow the creation of products that frankly don't exist in the market today. It'll bring in alternate funding sources. And from the flip side of that will be an opportunity for more investors to participate. There are going to be lower costs. Security token offerings are going to be more efficient, lower lower uh, stress, lower lower disclosure requirements, less rigor than um, IPOs. Uh, some, of the, some of the compliance activities can be automated through the smart contracts and lower fees as well. Um, they're also, it's also an asset class that ultimately will be borderless, although that is challenging given that security tokens are in fact regulated and as they do move across markets, they do suddenly reside in different countries with different laws. And settlement times. Again, with some of the next generation DLT layers, including things like Hedera Hashgraph, which we've built into our TOCO product, settlement and finality can occur within two to three seconds, which is obviously significantly faster than the, the typical conveyancing life cycle. From an investor's uh, perspective, there are potentially much lower barriers to entry, lower bite sizes. These are gonna be assets that are, that are backed. You know, they, these are gonna look a lot like a cryptocurrency does. The technology is in many respects quite, quite simple. A, Crypto and unregulated unbacked cryptocurrency is a simple version of a security token, but because they're asset backed and they uh, are therefore likely to be less volatile. Um, the trading platforms like we see with cryptocurrency exchanges as these things come online and we start moving these assets onto online exchanges, they'll operate 24 seven, they'll be very, very efficient, they'll be very low cost. And again, settlement times will be uh, far quicker than what we're used to even with stock exchanges. There's also an advantage to both sides around uh, reducing some of the friction points and taxation points and cost points in the, in the ecosystem and the life cycle. So this is a bit of a virtuous circle, but uh, if you start with, we'll, we'll maybe start at the bottom right around land registries, uh, the types of token models we've been building can avoid the, the need for a change of ownership at land registry level every time an individual interest in that land or as in an individual token is sold. So you don't have to necessarily bake legal and equitable um, rights into the token, and therefore you don't have to record when there is a change of those. And equally, you don't have to pay the stamp duty associated with such transfer. Similarly with uh, tax authorities, um, the ability to, to move those stamp duties at, at that level and also the company's registry level. Some people have been looking at tokens that are effectively um, digital uh, equity, so digital shares. Uh, again, if, if, if token is a digital share, every time somebody trades it from one person to the next, then you have a change of shareholder. Typically, companies' laws, including here in Hong Kong, do require you to then update uh, the share registry in terms of who owns those shares. Uh, and again, that attracts uh, similar sort of stamp duties and taxes associated with that change. And the final point on this is that it, there is now going to be a transparency of asset ownership. Um, the immutable nature of blockchain technology means you'll be able to track every single interest, every single transaction instantly uh, for free online uh, in a way that currently has to be done through things like uh, land registries. So the token platform that we've, uh, that we've built, and um, it, it is a digital asset creation, but also more importantly, an asset management um, solution that allows are all of the participants in the ecosystem to come in, to create the digital asset, to trade in it, to buy it, to sell it, to distribute it. Um, and the, the, the purpose state now, why, if you like, behind the TOCO project has been all around empowering value creation. We see enormous uh, amounts of friction uh, in current um, creation and distribution of assets. We see frustrations, we, we see liquidity, we see people struggling to do secondary financing because of the, the existing structures. And so we're looking to really support that. Uh, it can spit out tokens on a wide variety of asset classes. So it's somewhat agnostic in terms of it could be real estate, as we'll see later. We're also looking at a number of other asset classes. Um, it can uh, use smart contracts to deploy onto different layers as well. So people will have probably heard about the Ethereum platform, which is where the vast majority of smart uh, contracts today have been deployed. Obviously our TOCO engine can do that. But it's also been looking at um, issuing smart contracts and indeed tokens onto other platforms, uh, including uh, Hyperledger Fabric and Hedera Hashgraph, for example, which we think are going to be better suited to the creation of a truly effective and low cost digital marketplace. 
Um, the uh, other functions of this include the, you know, the full life cycle of the, of the token, so the ability to issue it, to transfer it, to redeem it, ultimately to, to um, um, claw back these transactions and, and to pay out. So some, some projects will have a finite lifespan, whereas some may be perpetual. We're also, although this functionality is yet, uh, yet to be completed, but we're also looking at using the technology to streamline communications, due diligence and information flow, information flow both at the original sale point and also in, in the subsequent life cycle, so the asset management piece. Uh, and I think that's going to be really interesting in the context of real estate because you have these quite complex real world assets, lots of information about what's happening in the building, what's happening with the rental, what's happening with the costs, what's happening with the refurbs, all of these types of things. And this technology can be used to provide a greater level of data democratization or information dissemination than perhaps we've seen traditionally in the market. And that's going to create a real opportunity, I think, for certain projects to stand out. Uh, not, all, not all asset owners are going to want this, um, but I think we might see um, those assets who do want this being able to differentiate themselves in the market by providing that greater level of transparency. Obviously, TOCO, it sits in a subsidiary of DLA Piper for regulatory reasons and the need to separate law from non-legal services. But it's uh, typically deployed in combination with the DLA Piper, um, you know, legal services, and that provides a degree of assurance that uh, I think is differentiated from other technology tokenization solutions in the marketplace, where we're able to provide a level of uh, comfort around the accuracy of the smart contract, as well as obviously traditional contracts, which would usually be in the form of investment documentation and white papers and things like that. We can also provide the assurance that the automatic parts of the smart contract in the token are actually executing in a manner that's consistent with those investor rights. Just want to quickly um, highlight this uh, project. Um, some people may have seen it, but as part of the, uh, the launch of TOCO back in November at Hong Kong Blockchain Week, we commissioned a, um, a piece of art. This is the piece of art uh, from a Beijing-based artist, uh, Wang Xiaobo. Um, and he produced this piece of art for us, which we subsequently tokenized. Uh, the investors in this case, it was something of a test cat, were, well, Sushila was one of them, but some of my other partners and colleagues here in the Hong Kong office of DLA Piper. Uh, we use the technology to create a non-fungible token. So the non-fungible token in this case was an Ethereum 721, where we built into that um, token template a fraction of the piece of the artwork. So we actually chopped the artwork up, not the real artwork, uh, to be sure, but the, um, uh, a photograph of the artwork was then uh, broken up into 16 different pieces and each of the 16 tokens that were minted had an individual piece of the painting put onto that token. Now that made them non-fungible in a sense. They were, they are all unique tokens. That's, that's um, um, uh, obviously different to what we could have done. The economic rights and the rights of use and the rights of return are, are all identical, but they are unique and they have a different picture built into them. Now this was something of a, a test case but it was quite interesting how immediately on the allocation of the, uh, of the tokens, um, there was a, an immediate marketplace was created with some of my partners looking to trade their token because they liked a different part of the painting to the one they were given, for example, even though the economic interests were the same. Now, this was something of a thought experiment and obviously to prove the technology to show that TOCO worked uh, and to do some experiments around custody and other issues associated with these digital assets. But if we take this thought experiment and then scale this into maybe the real estate context where you might have um, the ability to take a building, um, but rather than just issuing a fraction uh, that represents, you know, a one ten thousandth of the entire building, perhaps you could have some, some tokens that represented individual units within that building. And you obviously might therefore pay more for the uh, top floor with the view of the harbour than you might with the ground floor with the view of the car park, for example. So it was, uh, it was something of a, a, of a test um, to show the technology, but also to get people to start thinking about the ability to create these very unique products in digital form that could then be traded um, and have individual values potentially assigned to them. So quite an interesting project. And we've had a lot of, a lot of interest from uh, asset owners and intermediaries since we since launched TOCO. And this was, our, this was our test tokenization, the first one that we did. Obviously, it's not just real estate. We are looking at, you know, multiple other asset classes, uh, fine art, as we just saw with the uh, uh, finding the light picture, um, intellectual property rights, debt, funds, uh, shares. Uh, we're talking, uh, we're talking about reinsurance risk um, and insurance liabilities, and ESG as well. So, 
one of the things that I think we are, uh, and Sheila will maybe come onto this in the Q and A section, is looking at building in some additional value into say a real estate tokenization project. How do you build in ESG credits for a project that does have good green credentials, for example? And these are the types of things that frankly don't exist and we haven't seen in the market today, but this blockchain technology and technology using uh, security tokens will allow us to start providing uh, additional rights and additional uh, benefits to not only the issuer, but also the investors. So that was, um, I concede a very uh, high level whistle stop tour. And I think I already, as it, as it was, went over by a couple of minutes, um, but hopefully that's provided um, a little bit of a uh, useful whistle stop tour of the key aspects of tokenization. So I think it's back to you, Janice, to uh, lead the Q&A. Thank you for bringing it down for us, Scott. Um, it's very informative. It's a lot to take in for sure. Um, how does this TOCO platform fit with um, sort of digital assets in Hong Kong and with SFC's plans? I mean, has the SFC given clear guidance on how tokens are to be regulated under the current Hong Kong laws? Are they legal here? Are they, can we play? They are, they are, they, they are as of um, um, really only a couple of months ago. In the, I mean, that, it wasn't that they were illegal here, it's just the ability to deal with security tokens is regulated. So the ability to advertise, um, to distribute on behalf of third parties, to run digital asset exchanges, these, these types of regulated as, asset aspects of, of running a marketplace are, are certainly regulated, if indeed the token itself is a, is a regulated security. And not all tokens are regulated securities. We, you know, we, people will have heard about the ICO boom of 2017. Well, in fact, there are a number of other cryptocurrencies and ICO projects that are ongoing that we're, we're working on, and TOCO can spit out an unregulated um, asset just as well as it can a regulated asset. The technology is, is broadly speaking exactly the same. The legal difference, the legal assessment is quite, quite different. Um, but for the type of, you know, real estate backed kind of investment type token that, that we're probably, you know, really talking about in the context of this session, you know, I think it's fair to say um, there, a oh, great question in from David, I'll pick that up. Um, um, there is, um, I think an assumption that the vast majority of real estate tokens would be, um, would be regulated securities. So we haven't got any new law in Hong Kong, nor do I think we need any new law. Um, the SFO regulates securities, um, regardless of whether they're digital or not. The SFC has issued around a range of guidance around this. One of the challenges being um, getting more players in the market that are licensed to do this. We, were, we, we had a consortia that we put together last year and we were working in the SFC sandbox um, to um, help uh, promote the development of the Hong Kong ecosystem. I'm pleased to say that one of our um, one of our consortium members, OSLBC Group, they have in fact now got the first license in Hong Kong to do digital broker dealing and indeed to run a digital um, asset exchange. So it's now it's now fully licensed. There is in fact a way a route to market. So yes, Hong Kong is is now a market in which uh, you can issue, distribute, and indeed ultimately exchange put onto an exchange the these types of assets that we're talking about. It doesn't make Hong Kong the first market in the world to do this. There are already several uh, in, the, in the world that are ahead of the game, I think, and have had the sort of regulatory framework in place and licenses issued for a longer period of time. But it's equally relatively new in that there are a lot of other parts of the world, the Middle East, for example, where we're working with um, parties there that still haven't got as far as Hong Kong got. So it's, it's, not, it's not the front of the pack, but it's, uh, it's a relatively early adopter. And certainly we now have a, have a framework that works. Hmm, great. Um, so that's tokenization sort of opening up new markets for new investors. But I mean, it sounded from your presentation, Scott, that the benefits of real estate tokenization are more for investors who haven't been able to participate in real estate investments yet. So Shashila, can you tell me about what about the existing players? Why should the big real estate investors and the funds that are already playing in this space, what's in it for them? Why should they care about tokenization? I mean, they, they should care about tokenization. And I, I'm not saying that it creates a, a new sort of class of investors, not at all. I think the best players in real estate are the ones who've been investing in real estate all this time. So in, in Scott's slide, he sort of set forward the reason what to tokenization is and the, the reasons why tokenization is attractive. And perhaps let's rewind and look at how people invest in real estate today. So, Sort of investors, both uh, retail and, and professional, they invest in real estate directly. 
um, they may buy some interest in a fund, uh, they might go into the listed space or the REIT space. Um, so that is how people invest and, and it's, it's a good way. But there is you know, nothing wrong with that way. And I think the real game changer now is, is technology, Janice. What technology brings is, is three elements. So, with, with, so if the game changers are one, technology, because technology brings automation and, and the, uh, the blockchain technology. Two, actually it's, it's sort of unprecedented liquidity. There's a lot of liquidity in the market you can discuss the reasons why there are. But the question is, how do you then enter into this real estate, real estate space? And professional investors have a route to do this. And tokenization perhaps brings a, a new kind of efficiency. So let's talk about that in a minute. So it's the same kind of investors, but potentially ultimately retail, but that will, will take a, a little time for retail investors, but still professional investors. And, and the third thing is, I think this sort of shared economy has brought together a, a different way of enjoying real estate in a, in a shared way with more than just traditional interests. Uh, perhaps what tokenization brings, not just debt or equity interests in the way we understand shares or debt, but perhaps rights attached to real estate and tokenization is flexible enough to do that. So that would be uh, oh, the, th the three reasons why there are game changers today. And, and if I can summarize what, what Scott said in relation to why tokenization is attractive for real estate. Uh, I have perhaps five or six points. One, fractionalization of real estate is not new. It's, it's been around because there's a real high cost of entry. So you, know, you need to share the way in which you own real estate. So that's the same for tokenization. And with blockchain and technology, it sort of hopefully brings a degree of efficiency. That's what it brings. Uh, it also brings operational efficiency and that might be quite attractive for asset managers or managers of real estate because you can bring about smart contracts, and Scott talks about TOPO, because perhaps the way in which uh, the binary nature of rights set can be codified. Uh, and ultimately, that codification that sits in a smart contract can sit on a blockchain and leads to operational efficiency. So that's a biggie with smart contracts. The third one is you want speed. Everything is about speed today. And although in the listed space you can, you still want a market that prices it right. And hopefully with the transparency of, of, of uh, the platform and, and blockchain, you can get some pricing. There, there will be new ways of doing this. And don't forget, this is technology being brought forward to help people do something they've done for a long time, which is investing in real estate. So I think they, uh, sort of reduce settlement times, perhaps data transparency of ownership. And Scott went into some detail as to how you know, we have these uh, you know, well tried and tested ways, whether it's land registry or company house, I would suggest that debt interest in tokenization or any kinds of other enjoyment of tokenization rights could be uh, easily uh, tracked through technology. Um, and so that's that flexibility element. Um, and I, I will say again that the liquidity is important because whoever invests in real estate needs to know that there is a market to do this. And there is a market, you can, you can buy funds or, or fund interest, you can co-own real estate, you can go directly, you can go into the listed space. But what technology needs to do is to add another layer of efficiency and potentially have access to, if you like Janice, a uh, kind of technology investors who like the technology element of investing. And now you bring an old fashioned uh, asset class, which, which can be perceived as illiquid into the fray. Um, ultimately, you do want to think about over time for there being a secondary market where you can buy and sell these tokens. So that must be the natural evolution. Mm. King, what do you think? Do you agree with all of these advantages? Is, is this something that investors want, um, especially investors in and out of Hong Kong? Well, I guess uh, the people today, investors today are in a way forced to look for alternatives. Right in a low interest uh, environment, everybody is looking for yield. So if uh, having tokenized properties mean that there are some properties that are offering good return, well, of course, right? I mean, at the, at the end of the day is what the investors can get out of it. So in some, in some ways, it has something to do with the pricing. So, you know, the, the technology is just a matter of making those properties more accessible. But then if the owners uh, don't want to offer attractive uh, price points, the, the technology wouldn't help. 
So I guess the first point that I want to make is that uh, definitely uh, this is a great innovation that allows, uh, particularly today, right? I mean, some commercial probably home owners in Hong Kong are probably cash strapped. So now with this new avenue, perhaps they can have another way to, um, I guess, create some liquidity. And as such, uh, if they are willing to offer like a more attractive price points, then naturally the investors would listen. So I think, I think it's just uh, a simple fact that, um, you know, this is a, a new way to create new access. Um, so the, answer, the short answer is yes, but so, it depends. Uh, you bring up um, an important point there. One of the points that I think Scott mentioned in his slides was that um, the tokens, depending on what you bake into the smart contract, would give you real-time valuations um, and, and therefore transparency um, in the, the, the price of the real estate. How, how would that work in real life? Um, Scott, Shashila, do you have anything to comment on with that? I mean, can so, you really just go online and look up how much your token is worth tied to the property and then therefore then negotiate a price? I think I, to answer that question, I think you need to look at how any interest that you hold in real estate is valued today. It is no different because there are really three, maybe four types of token interest. Uh, one could be uh, an equity token, which is very similar to having an interest in a uh, in shares, you know, interest in a company uh, that perhaps uh, owns the real estate. So that has a valuation mechanism anyway. Uh, another way would be to own um, tokens that represent debt. So you perhaps are a lender into a project and in return for lending, the token re represents a return uh, at a fixed interest. And there is a way that you, you know how much you can buy and sell because that has a price associated with it. So it's not a new way of valuing. Uh, what technology might bring is a more uh, quick way of getting that valuation automized, uh, automated perhaps is a better word. Uh, so I, I don't think we are trying to create new ways of valuing. Um, and, and don't forget, real estate is um, an archaic, uh, highly investable. It's, it had lots of history. So what, what tokenization, to King's point, doesn't create a new product per se. Uh, the, the, the investment has to still good, be good. The real estate still has to be good. Uh, all the fundamentals of the real estate still has to be there. With the efficiency brought about by technology, whether it's transparency or operational efficiency, it might be able to cut a degree of management costs. And I, I might also suggest one other avenue because we are in a world of, of rapid changing um, uh, currency, if I, if I can say that. And one of the things that I think would be attractive to those who like the technology sp space and see it as the future is we have these cryptocurrencies and you can have your view about these cryptocurrencies. But I might even suggest that one way to make your, invest in, your investment into token is to, uh, is to use a, a cryptocurrency like, like Bitcoin to make an investment. Um, that's also another avenue for investments that could open up. Let me just add to that one um, as well. I think there's, there's likely to be a the issue around liquidity is volumes as well in market makers, and, and that part of the ecosystem in some respects doesn't, doesn't fully exist, certainly not in Hong Kong. I mean, we have one regulated asset exchange. I think I don't know whether it's one or two assets they have on there, but you know, it's, it's not a marketplace at this point in time, and that's really going to be required. I mean, in medium term, I, I think the idea of having something that looks like a cryptocurrency exchange but has regulated asset, you know, real estate asset backed tokens trading on it, then, then absolutely you've got a 24-7 what's the price of the building? Well, what was the last token worth? How many tokens represent that building? Multiply the two together, that's the value of the building today. And as I understand it, you know, in Hong Kong in particular, a lot of real estate um, companies or assets that, that are traded on the stock exchange don't trade it anywhere in anything like the real market value of the actual underlying asset in any event. So it's the idea that it's there's proper transparency on the Hong Kong exchange is something of a myth from, from what I understand. But while and until those um, sort of local exchanges get going and, and we have sufficient assets, sufficient liquidity, what we're beginning to see is the emergence of decentralized uh, trading systems. Um, I won't name names on this one, but we were exploring um, with one uh, only last week 
um, and anyone can, it, it's not run centrally. So it's a decentralized ex exchange based on the creation of liquidity pools by people that, that have security tokens. And they are then able to connect with investors who then settle on those liquidity pools in a way that creates a marketplace. Uh, and that all sounds a little bit theoretical. And so we were delving into it and they're, they're running at about a billion US a day in actual transactions um, already. Um, and this is for security tokens. So quite an interesting development that a fully decentralized uh, market has already started to spring up. Now, what's gonna happen with a, an iconic piece of Hong Kong real estate that gets tokenized? Is it gonna end up on one of those decentralized exchanges or is it gonna end up on something that's regulated locally in Hong Kong by the SFC? I think if the SFC doesn't uh, support creation of that ecosystem, I think we'll, we'll soon work out the answer. And we're seeing the same with cryptocurrencies. I mean, again, we're starting to see suggestions that um, cryptocurrency regulations which are coming through the, the FATF controls and the need for KYC ML requirements. Um, if the SFC you know, does impose its will that, that, that exchanges in Hong Kong will no longer be able to service retail investors for, for buying and selling of cryptocurrencies, I don't see people in Hong Kong stop buying Bitcoin. They're just not going to do it through an exchange located in Hong Kong. So I think there is a real, you know, there's a reality check here that um, either, you, either the ecosystems get created locally or the markets may move elsewhere because these are extremely dynamic and fluid assets in digital form. They, they you know, by definition, they're not, they're not bound by geography, notwithstanding that the underlying asset is obviously rooted in the ground somewhere. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? I mean, you just said recently that security tokens have recently been made legal in Hong Kong, whereas before they weren't. They, you, yeah, had, they were bound by the same. Made legal. It's, we now have a regulated, one, one party in Hong Kong has the ability to act as a dealer broker as a, for, okay. for digital securities. Um, and that same entity has the ability to run a, a digital asset exchange in Hong Kong for those regulated securities. So is your view then that we, there aren't necessary regulatory and legislative changes that need to be made in Hong Kong to make it more competitive, that we can, so long as they issue more licenses so that more people can play in this space, that it would be enough to make Hong Kong competitive? I mean, there are some views online that when I was reading up that there, it's a bit contradictory that some people feel that there shouldn't be any regulation of tokens that, you know, how can you achieve regulatory alignment when blockchain-based platforms are supposed to be you know, on the face of it, decentralized. So, um, oh, sorry, you guys are here. Yeah, so in, in the non-token world, not everything is regulated, right? So what is the security needs to be considered? And actually, you know, let's, let's talk about the world where private companies can distribute and uh, deal with their own uh, shares. So I think that the, that the same protections or the retail investor needs to be put in place in the same way that the market needs to adjust if professional investors can indeed buy and sell uh, tokens in a private company, whether they're debt or equity token. So that you don't need new regulations to, to deal with you know, many years of, of understanding how to protect uh, investors. So that's already in place. Um, if you're saying whether it's sort of because digital to tokens are digital and therefore you need a, another layer of legislation. I think um, the, the relevant regulatory bodies in Hong Kong has dealt with that. They've put, uh, they've put uh, sort of, um, papers out on how to deal with that. So there is that, that kind of indication of, of what digital uh, token issuers or, or, or exchanges need to have. So there is legislation. So if you're saying Hong Kong should issue more licenses, Ultimately, if they feel comfortable with the entities, I think that will be their plan. I don't think you need to have more legislation to dictate what can and cannot happen at this point. Right. But if Hong Kong doesn't have, I mean, the existing Hong Kong realist legislations on ownership and registries of ownership in Hong Kong are notoriously... Oh, I suppose it's, it doesn't have a system of irrefutable proof of ownership. So how would you build in this, on the existing to technology that did exist prior to tokens, Hong yeah. Kong wasn't as modern as it could be in that respect. So then how would tokens and blockchain fit into the existing land ownership system? And what I heard Scott saying before, and what you were saying about the different types of tokens, yeah. um, 
they're not about actual fractionalization of legal ownership of the piece of land, is it? Well, for real estate, no, because real estate, and it's not unique to Hong Kong, real estate in many countries is highly regulated because it's, it's, it's ownership of something that, is, um, that, is, that has a, a, a registry to record ownership. So not all, not all assets are like this. And so Scott mentioned tokenization of the physical art. So art doesn't have a registry of ownership. And you know, many other assets fall in that category. So you're right, real estate has got a land registry. Uh, which deals with title and the fact that it is not proof of title, 100% guarantee like some countries is, is not necessarily going to change and tokenization isn't going to do that change, not today. So you, you, what you do is, and so as an investment lawyer, you look at tokenization as a means of which to, uh, to divide interest. So it can be held by many um, players who want to uh, have ownership and this divided fractionalized interest. But what you don't want to do is to change what is already a, a working and trusted system, which is ownership of the, of the physical asset. So I think the tokenization that we are talking about has to be within the regulatory regime and the regulatory regime has already set out what a security is, what a security isn't, and it's very clear. Uh, it also talks about now with the issuance of the first digital type one and seven that you need to have, if you want to buy and sell tokens, uh, which are not in a private company, uh, type one or a type seven. So it does talk about that. And it is right. It is right that, that ultimately it is, it is protective and there is a regulatory framework to work with. Um, you're not going to change the land registry, not today. And hopefully one day, you know, even, even Hong Kong will have a, a system that, that will progress uh, with over time. Uh, it's just that there are so many different types of interest in Hong Kong and that's, that's the, the way the system works. But when you own a token, whether it is an equity or debt, you can sit out, uh, outside that or above that, if you like. You can do it in terms of the company, where it's a debt interest in the company or an equity interest in the company. An equity interest or token uh, displaying equity interest in a company has to abide by company's house uh, rules. So you, you, you can't sidestep that. Scott, did you have something to add to that? Uh, no, I'll pass on that one. I'm quite excited about some of the questions coming in. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we talked about, uh, you know, the in investment managers and the investors and, and, and even real estate owners and, and how this is advantageous to them. But King, the, because this is an alternative way to fundraise, how should the financial institutions adapt to this token economy? You know, what what should they be thinking about and, and maybe doing in this space so that they're not left behind in the dust? Well, I guess uh, the race has already started. Um, although the, mo most of the investment banks or the private banks, they are not making public announcements yet, but just through the, <laughs> the anecdotal comments I heard from talking to industry practitioners, you know, some of the more forward-thinking banks already reaching out to the tech providers in looking at offering this kind of services uh, to the clients. Well, I mean, their private banking clients, for example, can be someone who own a lot of properties and um, they may have the second or third generation uh, who might be more interested about the cool things uh, as opposed to the traditional way of making money. So naturally, if I were the private bank, I have to offer something that can attract the attention. So all these like new sexy buzzwords, right? You know, the tokens and everything, so a bill. So, so that's why just from what I know, I mean, it is already happening. It's just that uh, I think it's probably not fully mature yet. So that's why we don't see as many public announcements. Now, another, exam another example is that um, I've spoken with um, the owner uh, from a, I uh, would say, you know, second tier uh, property, um, you know, company in Hong Kong. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty sizable, but nonetheless, it's probably second tier. And they are, they've also been experimenting uh, different ways uh, to this whole innovation journey. So the one way that they, they, they did it, uh, probably almost like two years ago, to my understanding, and that's even before uh, SFC uh, has granted the uh, exchange license uh, to that company that Scott mentioned. Uh, so at the time, because because they want to make sure that they are doing things legal, legally. So that's why the, when they tokenize the properties, 
you know, one of the objectives is for them to, again, retain the talents within the company and also to experiment a way to let the millennials, the younger generation, to get access to property uh, at a more uh, modest amounts. So the, the way that they did it was basically to just tokenize some properties and given out the tokens as uh, incentives, as opposed to like a year-end bonus uh, to, their, uh, to their staff. So in doing that way, they're not, so strictly speaking, they're not selling the securities, they're just merely distributing these as incentives. So again, I think this is a pretty interesting way to get things moving when the whole sort of legal framework uh, was still in progress, I guess, under discussion. Uh, so, so now, I guess, uh, as the word uh, got out, I guess the second generation of the property tycoons, I mean, they basically, we talk to all these guys, they all take notice. Many of them are already looking into it. It's just that I think we haven't seen the announcement yet. So again, this, uh, the banks are in, in it. Uh, they're figuring this out in serving their, their clients. Uh, more importantly, the second or third generation of the private banking clients. Mm, thank you, King. That is really interesting developments. So we're talking about um, existing and established um, uh, well, establishments and how they are modernizing to sort of keep up with the times. Um, I want to move on now to some of our panel questions. Um, first one, in just an order of appearance, and the first one being law firms. I mean, they are not renowned to be um, quick moving when it comes to technology, although Scott, you are a technology lo lawyer, but why did DLA Piper create TOCO? You know, no law firms are doing it, and it seems it would have required a lot of investment in programmers and not sort of what a law firm would be normally expected to do. Uh, why did we is a great question. I sometimes wake up in the morning and think, why have I started this journey? Um, but more often, it's um, very obvious why we started it. It's DLA Piper has created a thing called the Radical Change Council, which was an initiative of our CEO, Simon Levine. I was probably, uh, I, this idea was bubbling around um, already, but the Radical Change Council provided a good incubation platform for the idea. Um, so we have got a fairly you know, yes, law firms are conservative. Yes, it has been an uphill battle to try and win hearts and minds to, to each of the gateway stages to get this done because it has a very different risk profile and you know, it's a different set of skills to the ones that our, you know, our, our, our business is used to dealing with. Um, but we have, got, um, we have got as far as we've got and we, we're definitely going further. So, it's, um, so you know, there's, there's, a, there's a will to do this within DLA Park that I, I think, frankly, a lot of law firms wouldn't have. So I, I understand that part of the question. Yes, we have had to acquire not only just programmers. I mean, uh, my background, you know, is in IT. I, I did do a computer science degree, but actually it's not just, there, there are programmers and programmers and programmers. You know, we've needed to have um, blockchain architects. We've needed to have crypto payments consultants. We're now looking at DeFi solutions, which are really um, coming from, from that sort of crypto industry um, as well, but now looking at how we apply those things to, 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 to security tokens. We've got traditional process engineer type um, uh, programmers that we've brought in. And, and the last batch, we've just brought in a UX UI. So the, uh, you know, the interface, the look and feel of the TOCO interface, the different persona views, whether you're an investor or an asset owner or a custodian, the different views that we're building in the TOCO platform to, to you know, allow the, the, the product, if you like, to, um, to function from the perspective of those who are interacting with it. Um, so yeah, we've, we've probably got somewhere in the region of 10 techies uh, working on the project. Um, and that is not a traditional law firm activity, that's for sure. Um, but it is quite good fun. I mean, why did we do this? Um, because of the Radical Change Council initiative, which is really around the recognition that if, even we must evolve at some point, you know, change is inevitable. Um, so we are looking to make the, make the firm uh, more relevant to our clients. I mean, one of, the, one of the things for me personally is the role of the lawyer has diminished, uh, even in my you know, career. Um, we, we've gone from being trusted business advisors, perhaps to people who paper the deal. You know, there's, there's definitely a trend in that direction for our profession, the rise of the big four, the consultants. None of them are any smarter than us. None of them are any you know, uh, more creative than us. It's just, I think, what's happened a little bit with, with the marketplace. And for me, this was an opportunity to recapture that trusted business advisor and solution provider, um, you know, philosophy. And being able to do this plus law is something that those that are only doing this can't do. Um, the complexity, you know, we haven't been focusing on unregulated cryptocurrencies because 
there isn't a lot of legal issues in there, although it's beginning slowly, but it's not really a complex legal nut to crack. The uh, complexity of the legal issues around a asset-backed regulated security top contract uh, are, are enormous and they are multi-jurisdictional and doing that within a DLA Piper, you know, one of the world's largest law firms across you know, 38 countries and 95 you know, offices um, puts us in a fairly unique position that we can grapple with that complexity of the regulatory issues while bringing the potential, you know, efficiencies and opportunities of the technology together. And, and frankly, you know, you don't get law firm level uh, assurance around the valid validity of a smart contract from a pure technology company. Actually, this is a true hybrid skill that requires you know, the lawyer and the technician to come together. So that's, that's kind of the why. Okay, Andrew, if uh, buzz in the chat, if that, uh, if you're unsatisfied or if you have any further questions with, uh, with Toko, I'm sure uh, Scott or Sheila would be happy to take on further questions on that. A quick question now um, from David. Is there a digital wallet or secure storage for these NF tokens? Yeah. Is, yes. Yeah, it's a great question because actually the entire world is not yet built for the sophistication of TOCO. So we're ready to spit out really sophisticated tokens using hybrid public-private chains, deploying them onto far better platforms than Ethereum in, in our view. Um, but the world of custodians, dealer brokers, et cetera, aren't necessarily ready for them. So there's a, there's a big technology integration piece that's going on. And we're, we're at the forefront of, you know, working with that technology integration piece, connecting up the dots, particularly with, you know, uh, projects like the Hedera Hashcraft project, um, bringing, bringing some of the players that we're, we're, we're working with to Hedera and trying to integrate those tokens, for example. Uh, in, in the case, I think this question popped up when I was talking about our, our artwork. Um, so I, I think it was around the, the non-fungible 721 token that we produced, which is, an, which is an Ethereum deployed token, but it's a 721. Now, again, there's, a, there's some complexity there. So, you know, the, the ability, we, we couldn't um, just drop this onto any token, uh, onto, onto any, any storage solution, some wallet solutions do allow for this. So we use the Ledger Nano, and the Descent device. So these are self-custody solutions, one with a password, one with a biometric control for people who wanted to store their private keys themselves. So we were able to integrate um, the 721 token onto both of those two self-custody solutions. We also offered, and this is again, part of, the, part of what we were doing in testing this with my, with my partners here in Hong Kong. We also did roll out a, a solution, again, a Hong Kong provider called Hextrust, who we, we work with in Hong Kong, that we're able to handle the 721. There are some other trustees and custodians in this market that we've been working with, but they couldn't handle a 721. They only needed, they only wanted to store an ERC-20 and I wanted to do a, a unique NFT. So yeah, it's a great question and it goes to the heart of the integration piece. Now, that integration piece is getting better every day, but it remains a, a challenge making sure that whatever is minted can, can go right through the ecosystem. Thank you, Scott. Um, next question, I think I'm going to go with what are regulatory requirements for Hong Kong security tokens uh, different from US jurisdictions like Wyoming? Um, what are, I think what are the different, what differentiates Hong Kong in this space from more friendly token um, jurisdictions, I suppose? Uh, uh, first thing I would say is I'm not convinced the US is a very friendly jurisdiction. Um, for starters, you know, it's got its challenges. It, what, what we're seeing in the US market is uh, a, mattering of STOs, but they are they are complex because you have to use the um, you know the federal level SEC processes um, and, and you know the Reg A plus and the Reg D solutions are they work kind of it's but it's a bit square peg round hole. There are you know there are restrictions on the number of investors. There are for example under US securities law um, you know, there are issues around resale of tokens within, within 12 months, for example, which is, you know, a US problem that we don't necessarily have here in Hong Kong. Um, so I, I, think, I think many markets around the world have, a, have a, an imperfect framework uh, for this at the moment. So Sheila, did you want to comment on any of the specifics around this? Or? Yeah, no, I can. I, I can't comment on, on US securities, but I would say most jurisdictions have the same conceptual protection of retail investors. Yeah. So it's the same and, and they have the same com, uh, sort of con, concept of what is a security and security are regulated instruments. So if you start from this, uh, the, the, the 
from, from basic fundamentals. Anything that is a security, which is a, a very defined term, is probably regulated. And most jurisdictions will have uh, exemptions to that where there are private company exemptions. So it's not unique to Hong Kong. It's, it's very same concepts. And then the other thing that people should be aware of is collective investment schemes or equivalents. So you have this in many jurisdictions. If you have money that is pooled and third party managed, the chances are it's a collective investment scheme. And if it's a collective investment scheme or equivalent, there are restrictions on how you market, the prospectus you create and how you promote and advertise them. So these concepts are the same across jurisdictions. They're just labeled differently. So the same with tokens, if there's pooling of income and it's third party managed and it's going to retail investors and the exemption to these kinds of collective investment schemes is where they are going to professional investors. There are other sort of monetary exemptions, but as a rule of thumb, professional investors and often these are specifically defined, uh, they tend to create a safe harbor rule and takes it out of the regulatory regime in relation to promotion and advertising for collective investment schemes. They still are collective investment schemes, but some of the rules in relation to marketing, adver advertising, promotion, and what you need to put in your promotional material uh, becomes less onerous. So I think all, all jurisdictions have those rules. They're called slightly differently, but it is all about making sure that investors know what they're getting into and have the information they need. And if you are a retail investor, there are more restrictions because you need more protection. Mm. That sheep takes us to the next question um, from Andrew. If this takes off um, real estate tokenization and proves popular with retail traders, bringing liquidity to the market, will the regulators move to block retail investors from benefiting from tokenized real estate to only allow qualified investors and big players to benefit? You know, same as the recommendations for crypto trading, uh, trading for example. King, do you have any comment on that? Well, um, I guess this, I think generally speaking, the uh, SFC has been uh, very cautious in uh, <clears throat> how they define the, the boundary. So obviously, when we work with our colleagues over there, um, they have done the homework. They talk to, uh, you know, the other jurisdictions that launch regulations on the crypto exchanges, for example. So they've done the homework. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's just a more prudent approach that uh, they would definitely would look at you know, doing it uh, with the professional investors first. And then uh, if it runs for, for a while and nothing, uh, nothing happens, then they, they, would, they would consider you know, other measures, right? So, but then are we gonna go there immediately? Uh, most definitely not. Uh, now, and secondly, when we look at uh, just uh, the way that uh, security tokens are by nature, again, I think, by the way, what I'm going to say now is not representing the uh, SFC. It's just basically common sense, right? Now, so the reason why the, I think the regulators are so, I mean, not, not just SFC, but uh, globally, are so paranoid about cryptocurrencies is that it's not backed by anything, right? It's how much the investors perceived the value to be. So you can build it up, you know, <laughs> almost like to infinity. So as a result, uh, I mean, it can be, it's a highly volatile. However, for security tokens, just by the very nature of it, it's backed by something. So even though the people can overshoot the euphoria, so you can basically pay something more than fair value, fair value but at least it's based on something. So the volatility uh, will be less compared with cryptocurrency. So, so therefore, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, when we look at how the whole thing plays out, so most likely, I think two, two things. And number one, uh, now I think I'm just go by my, rec uh, my recollection because I haven't uh, been following uh, the, the, the regulations very closely. But to my recollection, uh, the, the, the security tokens uh, being able to be traded on the, uh, the licensed uh, crypto exchange, uh, they have to be uh, listed somewhere else for like 12 months. And then they, they can be traded in a Hong Kong uh, based uh, licensed digital asset uh, trading platform. Now, so naturally, if something bad happens uh, elsewhere, then I think there's, there's a bit of a time period uh, for, for those issues to service. So, so naturally, I think that they, to my point is that SFC has been doing a great job to think about how best to protect the investors uh, locally in Hong Kong when uh, the whole thing is still emerging. So it's, 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 a, it's a journey. Uh, I, I just don't see that we can jump right into retail uh, 
in the early innings uh, in terms of like using the baseball analogy? I think it's one thing to, I, 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 I think there's a lost opportunity here. Um, Hong Kong is a, a market with out of control real estate prices that the vast majority of people cannot get on the property ladder. Um, the ability to get on a fraction of the property ladder would strike me as a wonderful opportunity for the people of Hong Kong to actually participate in, in the dream of home, home ownership. Uh, and by having a blanket ban, as they essentially effectively do on retail products by saying, real estate backed tokens are securities, securities can't be bought and sold by, by retail investors. I think there is a huge lost opportunity for, for social inclusion, but that's just my view. Shashila, uh, final word on, on wrapping up traditional assets inside of a tradable piece of code and its effect on the Hong Kong real estate market? Certainly, thank you, Janice. So today we've heard from, from Scott, who's very well versed on the technology and brings an energy and, and sort of uh, a real sort of uh, technology into a, a, an older asset class. You've, you've got King who's on the call face and really dealing with people uh, and, and you know the, 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 the real incentive to change. And I come from a institutional investment background, a little bit more old fashioned, but, but seeing that actually when you, you look at the exponential growth of change, perhaps uh, made even faster with COVID, there are, these are tools. So what, tokenization brings about are tools in which people can really properly, and I emphasize this, properly enjoy safely these, this asset class in a way that will make it much more efficient and accessible to all. So if, if we do all the right things uh, within the regulatory remit, and that's the point I want to make, you know, it, it, is, it is not cryptocurrency, as King says, not backed by something arbitrary. It is still backed by real estate, but the forum of which you use is still ultimately protected. Um, I, I think this has, has legs and um, you know, everything that, that we are trying to do as professionals is to create that environment to make investment better. Thank you, Shashila, and thank you, King and Scott, for um, your time and answering all of our questions. I'm sorry to our audience that we haven't gotten had a chance to answer all of your questions, but I'm sure if you ping them on LinkedIn or, or um, their email addresses, they might be able to answer your questions directly. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for Kancham for hosting this event. I'm sorry we're over time. Um, thank you, Janice. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you.